you're on. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's Easter service. My name is Alistair. I have the privilege of being the assistant pastor at Bransfield and the privilege of leading us through this Easter Sunday service. I'd like to start this morning by saying how much I personally miss gathering together with you all on a Sunday morning. But at the same time, just to say how wonderful it is to be able to celebrate Easter like this and to wonder, to celebrate that wonderful truth that Jesus is alive. He is risen. Having it our services like this is not ideal. It is slightly strange, but it gives us the wonderful opportunity to have others with us who wouldn't otherwise be able to. So let me just say a welcome to our brothers and sisters from People's Evangelical Church, some of our friends from Fernie Hill Evangelical Church, and some of our friends who are maybe virtual visitors, shall we say, and to everyone who said hello in the live chat. It is a real joy to be able to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus with friends from different churches, from different countries, and our visitors. My prayer is that this service would be an encouragement to us during this time, and that by the end of it, we would be challenged and transformed by the Holy Spirit. So let me just tell you briefly what this morning is going to look like. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to Fiona and the band who will lead us in a song. Then Peter, our youth pastor, will speak to the children. We'll pray together. We'll hear from two congregation members how the message of Easter has changed their lives. And then we will hear God's word read to us before Graham Shanks, our pastor, will preach from the Bible. We have the wonderful privilege this morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He is risen. And that's the truth that should resound throughout our whole service. I'll hand over to Fiona and the band to lead us now. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter to you. Christ is risen. I wanted to share a few verses from First Peter. Um, he says this in chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who were kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We are going through trials at this time. The current situation affects us all in some way, perhaps making us feel isolated, uh, missing the human contact that is so important to us. But even though um, we may not be able to see and touch our loved ones, we know that we love them and they love us. And in the same way, we do not see Jesus with physical eyes, but we love him. And we know how much he loves us, suffering death on the cross. And then through his resurrection, raising us to a living hope, undefiled and incorruptible, reserved for us in heaven, where we will see him face to face. Now I encourage you to join with Gary and the band as we sing Man of Sorrows. The chorus says, O oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honour unto thee.
to be with you again this Sunday morning. For anyone that doesn't know, my name's Peter. I'm the youth pastor at Brunsfield. And I want to speak particularly to the kids just now. And in fact, we're going to play a game. This is a game that we played uh, last Sunday at the Kids Church Zoom call. Uh, so it's a game called Opposites. And I want you to do the opposite of what I'm saying. So come out, uh, 
come and stand. Come and stand. You can try to get your parents uh, to join in with you as well. Anyone else, you can join in too. And you do all you need to do, simple, you just need to do the opposite of what I'm saying, okay? So if I say, stand up, you need to sit down, okay? Okay, and then I'm gonna say, stand up. No, say, sit down. And you stand up, okay? You ready? Yeah. Okay, let's see how well you can do it on. Okay, arms out. You have to put your arms in, don't you? Arms up. That means put your arms down, doesn't it? Side face. That means do happy face. Okay, and run on the spot. Do the opposite. That means stand still, doesn't it? Stand still. That means run on the spot. Okay, run on the spot. Sit down. Stand up. Sit down. Arms up. Arms down. Arms out. Arms in. Arms out. Arms in. Arms up. Arms down. Side face. Happy face. Side face. Sit down. No, stay standing, stay standing. Okay, well done, well done. I hope you did well at home. Okay, so now you need to sit down. And that means actually sit down. Don't do the opposite. You need to sit down, okay? So why are we doing opposites? Why are we playing that silly game? Well, last week we were thinking about Easter being all about opposites. And last week we were thinking about Jesus and how he should have been treated like a king. He was a king. He's the king of all kings and he should have been treated like that. He should have been worshipped. He should have been listened to. But instead, he was treated like a criminal. He was arrested. He was put on trial. And he was killed. And that made his disciples really sad. So Easter, when you think about those things, it's a really sad time. But actually, Easter is a really happy time because of what happened on Sunday morning. You see, the disciples thought that it was the end. Jesus dying, they thought, well, that was the end of everything. That's the end of everything they believed in. It's the end of Jesus and his mission and all his work and all the things he talked about well it's the end of all that but actually easter is the beginning the beginning of something amazing the beginning of something new you see at easter time we think about jesus dying and jesus being in the tomb dead and in the tomb well on easter sunday morning we remember that the tomb didn't stay like this. Jesus didn't stay dead, okay? Jesus became alive again. The tomb became empty and Jesus was alive. It was the opposite of what the disciples expected. It was the opposite of everything that had happened on Good Friday, Easter Sunday was the opposite of all that. So we can be happy, we can be really full of joy when we know that Jesus is alive again. So let me just pray for the kids just now and hopefully see some of you uh, at three o'clock at our Zoom call. Dear Lord, we thank you for Easter and we pray particularly for the kids. We pray that even though this Easter might be quite different and um, might not seem as happy as other Easter's, Lord, I pray that we would have real joy and real happiness. 
because we know that Jesus is alive again. Amen. Well, thank you, Pete, for that wonderful reminder of that wonderful truth that the grave is empty. Let's spend a few minutes praying together to our wonderful God who set that plan in motion. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the words that we have already sung for that reminder from Pete that Jesus was a man of sorrows, a man who took our place, God, in the flesh. We thank you that you stepped into our world. You stepped into our mess, into our sin, and you took our place on the cross so that we, a sinful, broken people, can be redeemed, saved and restored and have a right relationship with you. Lord, we confess that we are not worthy. Each of us, even this morning, have already sinned and have rejected and rebelled against your way. And Father, we ask for your forgiveness. And the wonderful truth is that we can know for certain because of Good Friday, that when we come to you and confess our sins, that we know for sure that our sins have been forgiven. And Jesus, we thank you so much that you were willingly went to the cross and took our place. And God, we thank you for Easter morning, that wonderful truth which proves that everything Jesus said was 100% true, that he rose from the dead, victorious, defeating sin, defeating death, and giving us life. Father, we pray for churches around Scotland, around the UK, and around the world this morning, or whenever they celebrate, that that wonderful truth will be proclaimed. And Father, we pray that that wonderful truth would reach ears this morning who need to hear that message, that they need to hear that Jesus died in their place and he rose again so that they can have life. Father, we pray for our government and our NHS workers who are working tirelessly to protect us and to stop the spread of this virus. Lord, would you give them wisdom? Would you give them strength? Would you give them comfort in this very difficult time? Father, we pray that you would put Christians around our politicians, Christians around our doctors who can be a support and an encouragement to them and who can point them to the only place where true hope can be found, that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, we pray for many countries across the world and governments who are trying to serve those countries. Lord, would you help them, many of whom are in very dire situations? Would you help us as a world gather around and support each other and help aid organizations as they would seek to help from a distance? And Father, closer to home, we pray for our church family. We thank you for the possibility we have of gathering together in this way but we pray for many in our church and in other churches who feel lonely, who feel isolated, and who feel down. Father of all comfort, would you draw near? Would you care for them? Would you encourage them as they spend time reading your word and praying to you? Father, would you help us all look after our church family? God, you are the God of all comfort. Would you draw near to your people this day? And Father, we thank you for that wonderful truth that unites us all in Brunsfield, in other churches across Scotland and across the world, that our Lord Jesus Christ did not stay in the grave, but the tomb is empty. He is risen. Father, would you help us today to declare that truth to a world which needs it ever so much? Father, would you be with us now as we continue in our service? Would you help Graham as he speaks later on? Father, would you help us in our own homes that we would have open ears and that we would have soft hearts, Lord, that we would be transformed and that everything that is said in this service would bring you all the glory. And it is for that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Earlier on in the week, Graham, our pastor, caught up with one of our members and asked her 
how the message of Easter and the resurrection of Jesus has changed her life. So I'll hand over to Graham and Maggie. Well, thank you so much, Alistair. Uh, folks, great to have you with us today. You might have noticed over the last little while, if you've been on social media, there's a hashtag that's doing the rounds and it's called How Easter Changed My Life. And really, it's just Christians up and down the country who are giving their testimonies uh, just about what Easter means to them. Uh, we thought it'd be a great thing for us to do this morning as well as we think about and celebrate this uh, another Easter Sunday. So we have Maggie with us this morning. Maggie, it's great to have you. Uh, thank you so much for being willing to be part of this. Maggie is a much loved and a long-standing member of Brunsfield, uh, and she's got much wisdom, which I'm sure she's going to share with us. Uh, but before we do that, Maggie, maybe tell us a few of the things that you've been up to during the lockdown. Well, I came back from New Zealand via Canada, was in lockdown in Canada for um, a week, and then came back every day, cancellation flights, so was never so glad to see home when we got home. And since then, I haven't put a toe over the doorstep. I'm in complete lockdown, but my wonderful neighbours are giving me bananas, grapes, everything good and cakes every morning for coffee. Wow. Um, so I'm just, oh, I'm studying my PhD, projects half done initially. <laughs> Hope you're clever enough to make that one out, okay? That's <laughs> great. Brilliant, Maggie. Well, you're certainly in good spirits. Um, maybe, we, maybe I could ask you that question and that we thought about just at the start there. Um, how has Easter changed your life? Well, when I was a child, I was brought up and um, going to church and Easter bunnies and Easter eggs rolled on Blackford Hill. And um, then when I was 10, I was at a valedictory, a farewell to missionaries from the Argentine. And we were singing a hymn and I was in between my mother and father. And suddenly... I'm afraid I've got too vivid an imagination. And I saw this rather plump missionary hanging onto a balloon going across the Atlantic Ocean. And a seagull popped the balloon and she fell into the sea. And I, <clears throat> like this, I got a, an elbow from my mother, an elbow from my father, and walked home in silence. And when I got to bed... My father came in to say good night, and I was in tears. And I said, "Oh, Daddy, I'm too bad for Jesus to love. Um, I've been naughty. I'm sorry." He said, "God doesn't like your naughtiness or your silliness or your badness, but God loves you. That's why He died on the cross at Easter time. Easter, but that's for bunnies and Easter eggs." No, he said, yes, that's just a wee extra. But mainly it's because Jesus died so that you might be forgiven and go to heaven one day. And that's my first thought of the real Easter. And then from that day on Easter, I've just, it's been special. Okay, I like the Easter eggs. But more than that, Jesus died for me, he rose again, and I can look forward to seeing him one day. Brilliant. Oh, that's brilliant, Maggie. Um, while you're on that last note then, why don't you tell us, uh, how does the message of Easter in your life, how does it give you hope? Well, because... Jesus died and rose again, the world, mankind, you, me, have hope. Uh, in 1978, I was in Jerusalem and we went to the garden tomb. And that for me was very, very special. And we had a wee service there. And I've never been at an Easter service that meant so much because I realised that there was hope in the world just because Jesus died. And for all who acknowledge that he died for them, they can be forgiven. So what better hope can we have than that? 
Absolutely. And then finally, Maggie, uh, during this time of, I guess, coronavirus, uh, how does the message of the risen Jesus, how does that change your perspective maybe about how you go about your day-to-day life and maybe how you view this period? Well, just so recently, it was scary being in Vancouver Island and being so far away from home and every day a flight would be cancelled and we had to rebook and we were going to Seattle, we were going to Iceland, we were going here, there, everywhere. But my friend and I, we just committed it all to God and we just said, God, if it's your will, take us home the best way and the quickest way. And he did. And Mm -hmm. I believe that God was in all that. Yes, Mm. it was a wee bit scary, but when we just left ourselves in God's hands, there was a peace. Liz and I felt a real peace that we were going to go home. And we got home and were welcomed at a distance by all our neighbours and friends. And it makes me, the whole thing makes me in this COVID-19 situation, not scared. I am not scared because if I get it, if I die, I know where I'm going. Mm. I've got security in my future because it's going to be with Christ. And I'm going to see Jesus, which Mm. is so exciting, far more exciting than going around the world. Because I have a hope in the future with Christ, I am at rest here in my home. Brilliant. Maggie, thank you so much. Uh, We could talk all day about this. (laughs) (laughs) That would be a joy. Uh, But we must we must get a wrap up and move on with our service. But thank you so much uh, for just sharing a bit of your story, a bit of your testimony, a bit of um, of how Easter has has changed your life. So thank you so much. uh, And now we'll just continue on in our service. Well, thank you, Graham and Maggie. Wonderful to hear how the message of Easter has changed your life. We thought it would be helpful to hear from another one of our members at Brunsfield who works in the NHS and hear how the message of Easter has changed her life and how it affects her work. So let me introduce Rachel to you all. Uh, And Rachel, I'd just like to first of all start by asking who you are and what you do. Hi, so um, as you said, my name's Rachel. Um, I've been a member at Brunsfield for about 11 years now um, and um, I also work as an a and doctor currently out at St John's Hospital in Livingston. That's great. And so how has the message of Easter changed your life? So I think a lot of people would find it strange to hear that the most defining thing in my life is a sequence of events that happened over well over 2,000 years ago. Um, but let me explain. Um, so. Jesus Christ was uh, publicly and brutally executed. His uh, death was witnessed and confirmed by experienced Roman soldiers. Uh, His his dead body was put in a tomb for three days, uh, which was heavily guarded. And yet three days later, the tomb was found empty, the stone rolled away. And then Jesus was witnessed in the flesh by hundreds of people, eating, walking, talking, pointing to his stars. Unequivocally, he was alive. And that's just as Jesus said would happen um, before he died and as thousands of years worth of prophets had also said would happen when the Son of God uh, came. So throughout history, people have tried to explain away uh, these these facts to uh, kind of deny their implications and come up with alternative solutions that it was all a trick or something like that. But actually, if you look at the, the, the evidence about what's happened and if you've not done so, I really implore you to 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 have a good look at that. Um, It's really overwhelmingly convincing that uh, that Jesus really did die and he really did come back to life. So obviously, humanly speaking, that's impossible, um, but um, it gives credence to Jesus' claim that he was indeed the Son of God. And believing that has changed my life. So if I believe that Jesus is who he claims to be, then I can also believe a lot of the the things that he claims and that the Bible says about him. And most importantly, that he has the power to forgive sins. So I can live my life knowing that 
all of my wrongdoing, my wrong thinking, um, my wrong motives, my wrong attitudes um, can all be forgiven and I'm therefore accepted by God um, as, as his child. Um, by turning around from my sort of natural inclination to reject God and to, to do things my own way, um, I can instead experience uh, joy and peace and, and hope from, from following him, trusting him and obeying him. That's wonderful. Let's, let's just pick up on that, that hope you mentioned there again. So how exactly does the message of Easter give, give you hope? Um, so I suppose, it, yeah, it flows on from what I was saying that um, I have the promise um, in Jesus of eternal life. Um, so that's something so much bigger, so much more fulfilling than anything that this world can offer me. Um, I don't fear death because I know that when I stand before God's throne, as the Bible tells us all of us will, I won't be fumbling to explain why I'm good enough, why you know the good I've done outweighs the bad I've done. Um, and in, in fact, I would have to persuade God of, persu- of perfection because that's his standard and I'd have no hope of being able to do that. But instead, I'll be able to look over to Jesus who will stand in my place and say, accept her because I died for her and she is mine. So that's that's just something that, um, that gives me, me massive hope, um, no matter what I experience in life. Um, and, and, and it can get me through the worst in life because, you know, life can be really hard. Um, but I know that whatever we experience here on Earth um, is a drop in the ocean compared to the glory that awaits us uh, when, when, we, when we meet God um, and experience that perfect love and fulfillment. Um, so anything I suffer here is going to make me more dependent on God um, and it's just going to make my, my trust in him deepen and then it'll be all the sweeter when I do meet him face to face. Wow, what a wonderful truth and a wonderful testament to the, the grace of God and the, the promised future that awaits. And so thinking about this morning, obviously the Resurrection Sunday, Christ is alive, he has risen, that, that huge mantra that has gone throughout the, the church historically. How does Jesus being alive change your perspective, I suppose specifically where, where you are and where you work, um, during this whole coronavirus situation? Yeah, so it's been, it has been really awful to watch the events of the last few weeks and months unfold, both worldwide and on a much more local level as well. Um, as I mentioned before, I've got the privilege of being an A&E doctor, and so I therefore witnessed firsthand a lot of the, the suffering, the, the disease, the fear, the loneliness and the distress that COVID-19 is bringing. Uh, fortunately, the situation up here in Scotland is not nearly as bad as it is down south in London, so I really... Um, feel um, for my colleagues there and for for people who are suffering down there. I admit I don't understand why God has allowed this to happen uh, to to our our country, our world, our generation, but I do trust him. Um, The Bible's full of examples of situations where God has used things that seem like negative things and defeat uh, to turn them around for for his own glory. I suppose Easter is a prime example of that. You know, the cross looks like, um, you know, that, that God's been defeated, that Jesus um, has been, has been uh, that, that, you know, that death, that evil have won. But actually, um, we just um, need to wait till the, the third day and we see that actually it's a triumphant victory over sin and death and um, that, that God was always in control um, and was always bringing about his, his good. Um, so, so yeah, I trust that reason for reasons beyond my understanding, um, God has a purpose in all this, and He'll bring about His glory. And it is perhaps it's a bit of a, a wake up call to to a lot of us um, to stop trusting in in earthly things that actually will all fail us. You know, our health, um, our loved ones. Um, you know, there's it's just a, a a stark reminder that that you know, that, that death comes to all, sadly, and that the only the only thing that we can trust on for eternity is our relationship with God. Um, personally speaking, I find the isolation side of things pretty tough, but I'm trying to see it as an opportunity to, uh, to you know, just try and get closer to God and uh, rely on him more and try and experience and share uh, with others the, the, the peace that he brings through it. That's, that's great. Well, let me just pray for you and for Maggie. 
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these two individuals and the wonderful testimonies that they've given us of how you have transformed their lives, how you have given them hope, and how now you are sustaining them and comforting them and giving them hope in this difficult time. Father, would you help um, them and our whole congregation in isolation? Would you comfort them? And Father, would you protect Rachel and the other doctors that we know and doctors in hospitals up and down the UK and across the world? Would you protect them? Would you give them wisdom as they make difficult decisions? And Father, as Rachel said, would you somehow be using this situation to draw people to yourself? We ask this for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're now going to sing a wonderful song, Here is Love, a song that describes the immense love that Jesus and God had for the world, that Jesus was willing to go to the cross and die out of love for a sinful world. So let's sing together. Here is love, fast as the ocean, loving kind as the flood when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who is love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he can never be forgotten Throughout hands eternal days On the mount of crucifixion Fountains open deep and wide Through the floodgates of God's mercy Load of us and gracious time, grace and love like mighty rivers poured in and from above, and then peace and perfect justice kiss the guilty world. Here is love, 
fast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Let me just highlight two things that are coming in the church this week. So this is our small group week, a great opportunity to meet with your small group over Zoom and study God's word together and to pray together. It's also a wonderful opportunity to get to see people as we're stuck in the house all day. So do get in touch with your small group leader and they'll be able to tell you uh, which night and what time you're meeting at. And if you're not in a small group and would like to be, do drop me an email and I can sort that out for you. And the second thing to say is that our daily Zoom prayer meetings are still happening at 8 p.m. every evening. And this has been a great source of encouragement and comfort to so many people in the church. So I'd encourage you all to join us at 8 p.m. every single day. And if you're not that comfortable with technology, as many of us aren't, it is possible to phone into the meeting either via your mobile or your landline. And if you'd like any information about how to how to do that, please do get in touch with myself or anyone through the website, and we'd be more than happy to help. And let me just say how personally I've been so encouraged to hear news of how everyone in the church is rallying around and calling each other and making sure everyone's doing okay. There are so many people always phoning people in the church, and it is a huge source of encouragement to them. So let's keep on doing that and caring for our church family. Now, just before Graham comes to preach to us, I'm going to hand over to Luca and Simona, who will read God's word for us. Good morning, everyone. My name is Simona. I'm one of the members at Bransfield Evangelical Church. Our first reading this morning is from Psalm 22, verses 27 to 31. Psalm 22, verses 27 to 31. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him, Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Hi everyone, my name is Luca. Our second reading today is from the New Testament in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 11 to 18. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. Let's pray before Graham preaches to us. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Gospels which tell us about the life of Jesus and which allow us to learn 
more about him. Father, thank you for Graham who has prepared for this sermon, who has studied these passages to help us reflect on them. And we ask you this morning on this special morning to speak to our hearts as we listen to the sermon so that we will be challenged to become more like you but also so that we will be filled with joy because of the amazing gift of salvation that you've given us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we just read about. Be with us for the rest of this service, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Graham. I'm the pastor here at the church, and it's a real joy to welcome you to our Easter Sunday service. The day that Christians around the world and down the ages know and celebrate as being the greatest day in history. Now, you might be wondering why on earth would somebody think that? Well, why don't you grab a Bible and come with me to the Gospel of John and to chapter 20. This is where we're going to be this morning. John chapter 20. And as you're turning there, let me read to you some lyrics taken from one of the best-selling songs that was on one of the best-selling albums that came out in the UK in 2005. And see if you recognise the, the song. The lyrics go like this. When the tears come streaming down your face, when you lose something that you can't replace, when you love someone but it goes to waste, could it be worse? Fix You by Coldplay. 1.25 million people in the UK apparently bought that single when it first came out. Many more bought the album as well. 1.25 million people, that's a lot of people. Which tells you something, doesn't it, about something of the song and that it was resonating deep within human hearts. Let me just ask you as you maybe think on that today, when was the last time that tears came streaming down your face? You know, we cry for all sorts of reasons, don't we, as human beings? The, the person who cries tears of jubilation when their team have just won the Premier League. The child who cries tears of pain when they fall off their bike. The parent who cries tears of joy when they have just witnessed the birth of their first child. There's all sorts of reasons that we cry in life. But I guess the thing to see is that that song is talking about another type of tears, isn't it? You know, rumour has it that Chris Martin wrote that song to help his wife at the time, Gwyneth Paltrow, process the, the death of her father. And we know that to be true, don't we? That's a pain that we all know in our own lives. And I imagine it's a pain that, that many people around our world at the minute know for themselves right now. And maybe it's a pain that you know in your life, even as you watch this. The tears that we shed when death so cruelly takes from us somebody that we love. And we're left with that feeling deep down in our souls that this isn't the way it was supposed to be. Now, whoever you are here today, wherever this uh, video catches you, whatever you believe about this God, the God of the Bible, let me just pitch you a question, one question to take us through the sermon today. And it's in those moments, where do you run? Where do you go as the tears come streaming down your face? You see, the thing is about the original Easter Sunday, just as we tap into John chapter 20 today, the curtain opens on this chapter, the first Easter Sunday morning, and you see how we see a woman who's crying her eyes out. In fact, you might notice we're told four times, if you've got your Bibles there, four times in these verses that this lady is weeping. She's heartbroken. She's distraught. She's confused. She's inconsolable. Here is Mary Magdalene. Now, Magdalene's not her surname, okay? Magdala is the name of the little fishing village where it's most likely she comes from. So Mary Magdalene's kind of like her nickname, the one that the disciples gave her to differentiate her from the other Marys who were on the scene. 
Mary Magdalene, there's all sorts of trashy rumour mill stories that are circulating even today about Mary Magdalene. We don't know an awful lot about her and her past, but there's one thing we know about her past. And it's the fact that she has a very troubled past. You see, when we first meet this woman in the Gospels, we're told that uh, demons previously tormented her. Now, whatever that means, what we can say is that she was a really poor soul. Right? She was a really troubled soul. There was no glittering career prospects ahead for Mary. There was no Mr. Darcy coming over the hill to pick her up to take her to the prom. There's no provision of a healthcare system that's going to help her in her time of need. There's no knight in shining armor who's coming over the hill who can make things better for Mary. That's what she doesn't have. But you know what she probably does have? She probably does have people in her village thinking that she's the crazy lady every time they see her crossing the road. And while the world turned away from Mary from Magdala, in her life, Jesus turned toward her in compassion and love. While the world walked by, Jesus reached out and he lifted this woman up. He freed Mary from her demons and he forgave Mary of her sin. Jesus gave Mary life. And flowing from that deep sense of gratitude and love deep within her heart, Mary joins the, the close circle of disciples who traveled with Jesus on his long journeys. And, and so as we come to John 20, Mary Magdalene, here's what we need to take in about what she's seen. She's seen Jesus triumphantly enter Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. She's standing there by the cross as he is crucified on Good Friday. She witnesses his body being taken down and placed in a tomb and she sees the stone that's rolled in front of it and to compound her misery, she goes to the tomb early on Sunday morning and that same stone has been rolled away. Now what Mary probably thinks has happened is that a band of grave robbers have been and gone. Not uncommon in this day for people to try and rob tombs to try and get the clothes off the body to make a really quick buck. So here's Mary, and this is where we kick into our verses today at verse 11, right? It's early on the first Easter Sunday. Mary's outside the tomb, and she's bawling her eyes out. Do you see how she's right there in those Coldplay lyrics? Truly, she has lost somebody who she can't replace. This is her. This is where she is. And she looks into the tomb, and there's two angels inside. Now notice in the text that they are at either end of where Jesus' body was. Now, given that on the Friday, Jesus is crucified with two men on either side of him as he dies on a cross, maybe we get a little taste here of what's going on. As God the Father is vindicating the work of his Son on the cross. But Mary sees these angels, they ask her why she is crying, they've taken my Lord, she says. And she turns around and she sees the risen Jesus in his resurrection body. And it seems that she doesn't recognize his face. And verse 15, Jesus, Jesus asks her, do you see it? Why are you weeping? Who is it that you are looking for? Now here's the thing, is if you pause and think about it, the thing about those questions, it's not as if Jesus doesn't know the answer. Oh, it was me you're looking for? Oh, why didn't you just say? He knows the answers to these questions. So what's going on? Well, here is Jesus lovingly drawing out Mary's heart here and allowing her in this moment to see the earth-shattering significance of this moment. She doesn't recognize him. Here's what I love. What does she think? Who does she think he is? She thinks he is the gardener which I always think is quite funny, right? I wonder if, if Jesus was carrying a pitchfork and wearing a John Deere tractor sweatshirt. I doubt it. On one level, Mary's so wrong. Why would she think this? And why would it be recorded? But on another level, whether she meant this or not, what she thought was so utterly profound. You see, the Bible story begins in a garden. 
It's a garden full of abundance and, and goodness. It's a beautiful place, which tells us everything that we need to know about the God who created it. God put Adam and Eve there to work it, to enjoy it, to develop it and to steward it for his glory, all the while living in that perfect relationship with their creator. Things are great. In fact, the things are more than great. They are very good. And God gives them one rule. He says, don't eat from that tree. And yet the bully, the Adam and Eve buy the lie of Satan and they do and chaos reigns. As sin enters the human condition, as sin spreads to every human heart, sin is more than just bad behavior. The things that you and I do and don't do all the time is, is deeper than that. It's an inner disposition that we all have that wants to reject God doesn't love him, doesn't honour him as he deserves to be loved and honoured and instead forces our own way. And our sin, it's a, it's, it offends God and it's separated us from him and it's left us deserving to be on the wrong end of his righteous judgment. Our sin, humanity's sin has put us out of the garden separated from God, away from him. That's mankind's predicament, out with faith in the person and in the work of Jesus. And yet here in John 20, what is Mary thinking? What is going on? The dots are being joined, Mary identifying Jesus as the one who is making a way for there to be, as it were, a new garden where we can know God's presence through his work, knowing the peace of being right with our creator, basking in the joy of fully knowing him as we were designed to know him. You see, Adam's life brought death and guilt for us. Jesus' death paid the penalty for our sin and brought us life and forgiveness. And so as he rises, and as, as God installs him as heaven's king, the one to whom all knees will one day bow, so the sun rises on a brand new world, where all those who in faith would take this Jesus to be their saviour and their king would know life eternal with this great God. Yes, now, but gloriously, fully, one day in this new creation. And in that sense, Mary's bang on the money. Jesus is the gardener par excellence. And so it's time for Jesus to reveal himself to Mary. And let me just draw out in the remaining time we have left, three quick things from these verses, which I hope encourage your heart no end this Easter Sunday. And so here's the first of these. Firstly, notice how Jesus calls Mary out. And I love this. This is wonderful. See what Jesus calls her. Do you see how Jesus doesn't go casual? He doesn't say, hey, oi, look. He doesn't go generic. He doesn't say woman. He goes personal. Do you see it? goes personal. Mary. He uses her name. So... Lovely in life, isn't it, when people use our names? Like in Starbucks, when they take your order and they write your name in the side of the cup, seeking to add just that little personal touch to it. And I've had all sorts of weird and wonderful spellings with Graham down the years, let me tell you. <laughs> One time it just said in the cup, G-R-I-M, Grim, which, if I'm honest, perfectly captured my mood that day. But they write your name on the cup, but as nice as it is, they don't know you. They don't know me. No, that's true in life, isn't it? Just because somebody uses your name doesn't mean that they know you. But that is not the case with Jesus. What's going on here? Here is the good shepherd in action. John chapter 10, Jesus called himself the good shepherd. Shepherd. Here he is, 
How is he the good shepherd? Well, he knows and he calls his sheep each individually by their name. And so contained in this one word is Jesus saying, Mary, my child, I'm here. Take heart. Be comforted. Know that I hold your life in my hand. You see, that is the kind of relationship that Jesus has with his people. He calls us by name and we respond to his voice. We know his voice in our lives. Do you notice that while Mary doesn't recognize his face, she knows his voice? Here is the good shepherd calling to one of his sheep and saying, I'm here. And friends, you and I can know his voice today as we open the pages of our Bibles. And I wonder if some of us need to take great comfort from that truth this Easter Sunday Jesus calls her out. Secondly, notice very quickly that Jesus welcomes her in. You see, her life might in many ways look insignificant. But Jesus wants her to grasp the truth that because of him, she is now part of something truly magnificent. Verse 17. And notice in this little section, and what Jesus says here, notice the vertical and the horizontal dimensions to what he's saying. Because Jesus explains to her, doesn't he, that he's going to ascend and hear the language in his voice. He's going to ascend to his father and her father. He's going to ascend to his God and her God. And so Mary, who was once a stranger to God because of her sin, because of what Jesus has done on the cross for her, is now beckoned to come and know this wonderful privilege of knowing her creator God as her father. In the same way that Jesus knows him as his father. What an incredible blessing. One that is the right of every single Christian the world over down the ages. How dare we use this? How dare we call God our Father? Yes, because of Jesus Christ and his work for us. Oh, what a wonderful privilege. And then you see Jesus telling her that she has to go tell his brothers, Jesus's brothers. This, there's a new family relationship being established here. So Mary is now part of this new global family of faith. As Jesus gathers for himself through the ages a people from all corners of the earth, a people from all walks of life, a people doing all sorts of different jobs, a people with all sorts of different interests, a people from all different generations, a people from every tribe, tongue and nation called to be Jesus' one church and who Jesus says brothers and sisters to incredible privileges. Jesus calling his people out with the express purpose of living for and worshiping him. And thirdly, notice how Jesus sends Mary on. You know, there are many privileges in life. Maggie, who was on just a a few moments ago, I always remember got chosen last year to go and meet the queen at Buckingham Palace. What an incredible privilege that is. But even the greatest privilege is nothing compared to the one that is bestowed on Mary here as she becomes the first witness to the risen Jesus. What an honor, what a privilege. And you have to say what a surprise in many ways that Mary would be the first witness. But then again, this is the God of the Bible. He is the God who is in the business of lifting up the humble and casting down the proud. The God who uses the weak and the seemingly insignificant things of this world to shame the strong. And so the God who chose the shepherds to be the first messengers of the news about the birth of his son now chooses this 
Mary, who, if we're honest, has not got a lot going for her in many ways except a devoted and a loving heart to be the first herald about the news of his risen son. And she runs and she proclaims the theme that has been the anthem of the church down the ages and the one which fuels Christian mission across the globe, that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that is great news. That is the gospel. That is the, the, the message that's at the heart of the Christian faith. Jesus lived he died, he rose, and one day he will return. The famous words of Christian missionary Jim Elliot, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And so here is Mary Magdalene. And we don't know what happened to her after this point. You go on Google, you'll find all sorts of weird and wonderful attempts at it. But the truth is we just don't know. But what's almost for certain is that life wouldn't have been all rainbows and unicorns for Mary after this point. I mean, if you're carrying this message to a world about the guy who the world wanted dead, it ain't, it ain't gonna go well for you, I'd imagine. Imagine that life for her would have been the same as it was for the other disciples who took the message of the risen Jesus to the world. It's funny, I was reminded of this the other night as I was reading. Do you know what I was reading? I was reading Where's Wally? With my kids, a lad, but I was reading Where's Wally? And on one of the pages, you had to find Wally in the, in the Colosseum in Rome. So we're sitting there, the three of us looking for him, and, and the girls say to me, Daddy, Daddy, what does it say at the top? And I read to them the caption at the top, and it simply read, Here in Rome are the Christians being thrown to the lions. And so there they're off, they're trying to look for Wally, they're trying to look for the wizard. And I'm struck by that comment. And I'm led to think of the first disciples. I'm led to think of my brothers and sisters who first carried the torch for Christ. Because that was the reality for those who followed Jesus. Sure, that would have been the reality for Mary. But what's for certain is that Mary would have known pain in her life. She would have known the loss of loved ones. She would have known herself what it is like to feel that you are on your way out of this world, that you are dying. She would have died. Let me ask you, where do you run in those moments? When the tears come streaming down your face. When you lose someone, something you can't replace. When you lose someone but it goes to waste. What could be worse? Where do you go? Answer, the invitation as we look at Mary here and as we look at the risen Jesus is we have got nowhere else to run but to the man who has defeated death and is alive forevermore. We are called to run to the risen Jesus. Mary's saviour lives. He lives. You see, Mary's not got hope. Mary's got Christ, and Christ is her living hope. And because he died, and because he now lives, she one day too, no matter what happens to her, even though she dies, will one day live with Jesus forever. He is our living hope. He is the hope of every single Christian down the ages in this world. Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, returning. The one who we read at the end of the Bible is the one who will make all things new. The one who will wipe away every tear. The one who will banish death forever for we will be in God's perfect kingdom. Here is Jesus standing victorious, having conquered the grave, having atoned for our sin. Here is the lamb that was slain and here is the roaring Lion of Judah who has defeated the power of sin and death. And so even in our darkest moments, and friends, we don't know what's going to happen over the next few months, but what we can know is that even in the shadow of the valley of death, here is a shepherd who walks close with his people. And here is a shepherd who has given his life so that his people could go free. 
And here is a shepherd who, even in our darkest moments, invites us to come and put our faith in him, in him and join in the chorus, the one that's been the anthem of the church down the ages. And with this we close. It goes like this. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Let me pray for us as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. And that even as we journey through the uncertainty of this life, that as we look at the crucified, risen, and one day returning Jesus, we can have hope. And so, Father, we ask that you would help us to look to him and have our eyes fixed on him. Father, thank you that you love us. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious and perfect name. Amen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus played and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree Jesus.
Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning in our Easter Sunday service. If you have any questions or you'd like to speak about or pray about anything that you've heard this morning, then please do get in touch with me or anyone on our website. It would be an opportunity. It would be a wonderful privilege to serve you in that way. And a special thanks to those who've contributed this morning, especially to Gary and Esther for all the hard work that they've put in throughout the week to make these services possible. But let me just end our service with these wonderful words from Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, Jesus is risen. Have a happy Easter.
by the precious blood that my Jesus built. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, always free indeed. Now my death. Don't.